Hello everyone, Sula here, host of Sula's Big Adventures, and this is chapter 12 of my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer. Chapter 12, Observing the Planets. Today is August 14, 2022, and today Saturn is at opposition. So what better day to talk about the planets than today? When they're at opposition is the absolute best time to look at the planets. There are eight planets in our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And they will always appear in the sky on the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun as seen from Earth. In chapter four, I talked about placement of the stars, the moon, and the planets. And in this chapter, I'm gonna talk about observing them. You can observe five planets with your naked eye, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You can add a sixth planet to that list if you use binoculars, and that would be Neptune. And with a telescope, you can see all eight of the planets and the dwarf planet, Pluto, and the asteroid Ceres but they will only appear as tiny dots. When observing the planets, it is very important to use high magnification with good optics. It's not so important to be in a dark sky site um, when looking at planets. They're so bright that you can see them generally just as well in a light polluted area as in a dark sky site. The best telescope for planets are high quality refractors, but those are also the most expensive telescopes per inch of aperture. Other telescopes that work equally well are Maxitoff Cassegrains and well collimated Newtonian reflectors. An important consideration is your telescope's resolving power. The larger the aperture, the higher the resolution of your telescope. But you must also consider the exit pupil and you must use high quality eyepieces. There's a book, I've never read it, but it will evaluate your telescope's quality for planetary viewing. It's called Star Testing Astronomical Telescopes by H.R. Sutter. And that will help you determine the quality of your telescope for planetary viewing. As I mentioned in chapter 10, the chapter on eyepieces, the best eyepieces for planetary viewing are orthoscopic eyepieces. I don't own any and they are hard to come by, but they are the best for viewing the planets. If you're using a manual mount, then you probably want to use an eyepiece with a large field of view, such as a Nagler or something like Teleview Ethos, which will keep the planet in the field of view for a while, allowing you to observe it without having to move your telescope. One of the viewers of this channel also mentioned bino viewers, and those will allow you to observe the planets with both your eyes. And this would be an excellent idea for planetary viewing, but you would need to buy the bino viewer as well as extra eyepieces. I don't have a bino viewer, so I can't speak to it, but it sounds like a great idea. In general, keep your eyepieces and your diagonals clean because they're close to your eye and uncleanliness in them will degrade the image. Contrast. Make sure that your telescope has been given adequate time to cool down. Adequate thermal equalization is extremely important and critical 
for good viewing. As I discussed in my video on Maxitoff Cassegrain telescopes, they are closed systems and they therefore take a long time to cool down. So give them adequate time to cool down. Same goes for Dobsonians because the mirrors at the end, it takes a long time for them to cool down. If you don't, then you're going to have localized turbulence and it's going to degrade your image. Local heat sources such as pavement, houses, cars, and even a person standing near your telescope can emit heat and that can also degrade the quality of the image. If you defocus on a bright star and there are rivers <laughs> of movement, then there are probably some heat plumes nearby. You can try to move your telescope or it could just be atmospheric turbulence, in which case you will just have to observe on a different night because that cannot be helped. I try to stare at the planets for as long as possible so that I can wait for the turbulence to calm down and get a better view possibly. It is possible to see planets during the day. Venus is often referred to as the morning star. It's not a star, but it's called that. And it can be seen early in the morning. And Mercury is so close to the sun that it is often only seen just before sunset or uh, sunrise. Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars can all be seen during the day, but it's difficult to find them. And there may be some haze making the viewing suboptimal. When viewing the planets, try sketching them. This can be helpful because it will force you to look at details and take a critical examination of the planet and can also be rewarding. It takes time to train your eyes to see all the details on the planets. And we will cover imaging of the planets in a later chapter. But for now, I'll just tell you that for imaging the planets, it's better to take a video and then process it with some software into a picture. You don't even have to take very much video, just maybe 30 seconds worth. But we'll get to that later. For now, observing each planet. Mercury is the planet closest to the sun. It's never more than about 28 degrees from the sun. It's a rocky, airless, planet and it's much like our moon is pocked with craters. Mercury can only be seen low in the sky at dusk or dawn and the disk is small only five to ten arc seconds. For the two inner planets Mercury and Venus we talk about their elongation. Elongation is simply means how far their distance is from the sun. When they are at e their greatest elongation, that is the best time for viewing the two inner planets, Mercury and Venus. You will never be able to make out any detail on Mercury, given its small size and its proximity to the sun, but you can make out phases on Mercury and Venus, uh, even in a small telescope, it will show Mercury's half phase during the latter half of prime viewing time in the evening in springtime. That's the best view that you will ever get of Mercury, and it will be at greatest elongation at that time. Probably best seen with the Maxitoff Cassegrain. 
Mercury takes 88 days to orbit the Sun, and it rotates on its own axis every 58 days. Mercury will be at greatest elongation on August the 27th, 2022, and it will be at magnitude 0.2. Now let's talk about Venus. Venus is known as the evening star and the morning star because you can see it in the morning and the evening, but it's not a star. It reaches greatest elongation twice a year as it moves back and forth from one side of the sun to the other. Venus ranges in magnitude from negative 4.9 to negative 3.8, and it has a surface temperature of 460 degrees Celsius with a dense carbon dioxide atmosphere. It has thick sulfur dioxide clouds and sulfuric acid droplets that veil the surface. Occasional cloud structure can be seen in an amateur telescope, but for the most part, what you will see when you look at Venus are featureless white disk. The best time to view Venus is between its thick crescent phase and mid gibbous. On its date of greatest elongation, Venus will appear half illuminated like our uh, quarter moon. If you try to see Venus during the day, please take extreme caution not to accidentally look at the sun because Venus is the second planet from the sun and if you accidentally look at the sun you'll go blind. Now let's talk about Mars. Mars has a rocky surface and it can reveal details when viewed through an amateur telescope but it's so far away <clears throat> that the features are difficult to see. Every two years and 50 days for three to six months Mars has its biennial opposition. On December the 7th 2022 Mars will reach opposition, and it will be magnitude negative 2.9, and it will reach 17 arc seconds. Your view of Mars will depend not only on how close Mars is to us, but also how high in the sky. For this year, 2022, from September through December, Mars will be in Taurus, and it will be at plus 20 degrees declination. Also, um, Mars will be occulted by the full moon on the night of opposition. So that's something to look for. Mars is always difficult to see well, but you can make out details during near perfect conditions, <laughs> meaning there's no atmospheric turbulence and the air is calm. Sometimes that's on a foggy night, according to Terence Dickinson, but I don't know about that. And at those times, you can see a half arc second with an eight inch telescope. This telescope is six inches and I have a camera on it because I'm gonna try to take some video of the planets later on. These clouds move off. One arc second is more typical with a four inch telescope. Use a big telescope with good optics and about 250 to 360 times magnification, depending on the aperture of your telescope. And you can see the polar cap during opposition and also the dark patches such as Sirtis Major on the peach colored surface of Mars. Mars rotates 24 hours and 38 minutes. So if you look at it, the same time each night, you're going to see nine degrees farther each night. Filters can help uh, see features on Mars. I have this filter. I don't know what color it is, but it's made by Orion and it's called the Mars filter. And it will help you see the features on Mars better. I finally had a chance to use it the other night, but all it did was turn Mars pink, but I think it will help when Mars is at opposition and higher in the sky, because the night I looked, it was pretty low. 
Also, filters work best on bigger telescopes, bigger than six inches. Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos, but they are a real challenge to see because they are so much dimmer. But the best view you will ever have of Mars is when seeing conditions are superb and Mars is at opposition. So keep trying to look at Mars in December. 2022 is when it will be at opposition. And if you're watching this video after 2022, Mars will return to opposition in 2025. Next, we're going to talk about Jupiter. Unlike Mars, which requires superb optics, superb seeing, and high magnification, Jupiter can be viewed with even a small telescope. Even as small as an 80 millimeter refractor will reveal much detail on Jupiter. Jupiter moves 30 degrees per year, and in its 12-year orbit around the Sun, it visits a new constellation of the zodiac about every year. Jupiter is the third brightest object in the sky behind Venus and the Moon. Jupiter has about 80 moons, and four of them are readily visible in binoculars. With a fifth, a tough challenge. Jupiter is a gaseous planet, and it's surrounded by constantly changing clouds. So what you might see will vary. However, the three to four dark belts are always visible. And sometimes you can see up to eight belts, depending on the conditions. Jupiter's great red spot is not visible at the edge of Jupiter's disk, but rather is visible clearly only when Jupiter's um, rotated a quarter of the way around. And the same is true of all the features of Jupiter's surface, which will rotate out of view in two and a half hours of viewing. The app Sky Safari and Sky and Telescope magazine will tell you when the great red spot will be visible from your location and when it will be centered in the disk. Jupiter rotates on its own axis every nine hours and 51 minutes. So start sketching it in the first 10 minutes and fill in the details later because it will rotate out of view. You will need at least a 90 millimeter refractor to see the great red spot. Large aperture telescopes that have a higher magnification limit will improve the contrast, the color, and the fine details visible on Jupiter, especially a high quality apochromatic refractor. So why am I standing next to my Dobsonian? <laughs> because it's 10 inches and it's a big light gathering bucket. Anyway, 200 to 320 millimeter Cassegrains and Newtonians that are well collimated will do well to improve the contrast on Jupiter, as will a filter. I have a Jupiter filter and I haven't tried it yet. Uh, this Ju Jupiter filter is called number 80 medium blue and it's also made by Orion and I will find out tonight if it improves the contrast on the belt. and the cloud features. Jupiter will reach opposition on September 26, 2022, and it will shine at magnitude negative 2.9. It's closest approach to Earth in 70 years, so get out there and look at it. On April 27th, Jupiter and Venus were just 14 arc seconds apart, and I got up at an uns insanely early hour to get this photo of this conjunction. Another fun thing to do when observing Jupiter is to view a transit of one of its four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Sky Safari and Sky and Telescope magazine will list accurate depictions of the locations of the Jovian moons to identify them at your eyepiece. 
and also you can find when there will be a transit. The Jovian moons are from four to five magnitude. Io, the innermost planet, is visible as a brilliant dot on the dark limb, but it'll become lost when it reaches the white parts of Jupiter. Europa, the smallest of the Galilean moons, is a bright white and it's most visible during a transit if it crosses a dark belt. Ganymede is the largest satellite in the solar system and it's the easiest to track as it transits Jupiter because it is brownish colored. Callisto, the outermost moon of Jupiter, is the easiest to track across Jupiter's surface during a transit because it has a dull, dark surface. Seeing a moon's shadow on Jupiter is easier to see close to opposition. Each moon shadow appears close to the disk of the moon as it transits Jupiter. And the shadows are well separated. Now let's talk about Saturn. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system and it takes 29 years to orbit the sun. It takes about 10 hours for it to rotate on its own axis. Ask anyone, what's the most stunning thing they've ever seen in a telescope? And most people will say, Saturn's rings. You can see Saturn's, uh, Saturn with your naked eye and with binoculars, but in order to see Saturn's rings, you will need a telescope. But it can be as small as a 60 millimeter refractor. For most of its 29 year orbit around the sun, Saturn's rings are tipped toward us for superb views, but occasionally the rings turn edge on and they disappear. The rings are tens of meters thick and they're made up of rock and ice. And in a telescope four inches or larger, you can make out the A and B rings. There is an A, a B and a C ring. And the line dividing the A and B ring is known as the Cassini division. To see the innermost ring, you would need a six inch or larger telescope and a well-trained eye. That means staring at the object for prolonged periods, sketching it, and uh, getting your eye accustomed to what to look for to make out the features. Sometimes when the viewing is excellent and the tilt is right, you can see the shadow cast by the rings on Saturn's surface. And you can also see seven of Saturn's moons with an eight inch or larger telescope. The largest Saturnine moon is Titan at magnitude eight, and it can be seen with a 70 millimeter telescope. Titan is the only Saturnine moon with an atmosphere. Its orange clouds rain methane and NASA is going to send a probe up to it soon. Other moons you may be able to see are magnitude 9.7 Rhea, magnitude 10.4 Dion, and magnitude 10.3 Tethius. Next, we're gonna talk about Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is the seventh planet away from the sun and it was discovered in 1781 by William Herschel with a 160 millimeter Newtonian reflector. It takes 84 years for Uranus to orbit the sun and it's usually at about magnitude 5.7 and it can be seen naked eye and with binoculars but even with a telescope it will only appear as a pale blue disk it has around 27 moons, but they are uh, magnitude about 14 and they're out of reach of most amateur astronomy telescopes. Next, let's talk about Neptune. Neptune is the outermost planet from the sun. It was discovered in 1846. 
and it shines at about magnitude 7.8, you'll need a star chart or software or a go-to telescope to find Neptune. It appears distinctly blue in a six inch telescope like this Evo Star 150 millimeter. It has one large moon, Triton, that can be seen in a 250 millimeter or larger telescope. In 2006, Pluto was degraded by the AA IAU to a dwarf planet. It was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh and it can be found in the Kuiper Belt. It takes Pluto 248 years to orbit the sun and it's challenging to find and to see. It will never appear as anything more than a dot. I think I've seen it once. It's nothing to write home about unless you just like to keep records. Another dwarf planet to look for is Ceres at about magnitude 7.7, .7, and it appears between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. It will just look like a little dot also. Now I'm looking at Saturn through my 12-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain. I can make out some surface detail because of the bigger aperture, but one thing about this fork mount is it's very susceptible to any kind of movement. So you cannot touch it, but it does help to have the big aperture. I've got a three-time Teleview Barlow with a 32 millimeter eyepiece. And I did upgrade my diagonal to a Teleview Dielectric Everbright. And that helped a lot because the stock diagonal it came with was a piece of beep. But um, it looks really good. But I like it in the 10 inch Dobsonian too. It's, um, you know, you have to keep pushing it and it goes out of the field of view. But, it looks really good in the Dobsonian too with this three time Barlow and I had a 24 millimeter eyepiece attached to it. The bigger aperture helps a lot, but the Dobsonian is a little bit more stable uh, so that I can get my eye closer. If I even touch this, it makes it move a little bit and you have to wait for it to settle down. But wow, spectacular, <laughs> it is spectacular. So this is just the camera directly attached to the schmidt cassegrain telescope, in other words. So 12-inch Mead schmidt cassegrain with my Sony A7S III, Saturn at opposition, and it's about midnight, so it's almost August 15th. Saturn at opposition.